So, 411 Thunder came out back in July last year. At the time it was really divisive, but now I think people have just concluded that it's not a very good movie. As of right now, the movie has a 64% on Rotten Tomatoes, making it 29 out of 30 in the ranking of Marvel films by critic scores. That's even worse than Thor The Dark World. No one was kind to this movie when it came out, but is it really that bad? Granted, whether the film is bad or not isn't really what I'm here to talk about. I liked it personally, but I recognize that I'm a big Marvel apologist, or a Marvologist, if you will. Still, I recognize the story has its flaws. I just graduated in English teaching, hoping to go to grad school in creative writing, so I thought it might be a fun exercise to rewrite this movie, hoping to fix some of its flaws. Now, having rewritten the story, let's talk about a few of the things I'm attempting to fix. First, Thor's arc. Stories are about characters. Ultimately, I believe all literature is about what it means to be human, even if the story in question is about an alien god. So what is Thor Love and Thunder trying to tell us about humanity? Well, something about love, certainly, right? Something like, love is stronger than hate, we should spend time with those we love. The fact that I can't even pin down the message exactly shows the problem. It doesn't have to be literally spoken to me by one of the characters in the movie, but it needs to be clear throughout. We know that there are three types of arcs, the positive change arc, the flat arc, and the negative change arc. If we look at it objectively, it kind of seems like Thor isn't changing at all. He already knows the value of love, so he'd be going through a flat arc. In fairness to the writers, where do you take the character of Thor after everything he's been through? That was one of the biggest challenges in doing this exercise. There is one character who does have a positive change arc, that being Gore. On top of that, Jane has some kind of change, denying the severity of her cancer, and ultimately succumbing to it, kind of. But if Gore and Jane are the ones with arcs in this movie, why is Thor the main character? This brings me to my second problem with the movie, Gore. No one can deny that Christian Bale put in 110% with what he was given. His performance was one of the highlights of the movie, and I was kind of left wanting more. But the problem with Gore reflects a broader problem with most Marvel villains for me. Sung Wan Cho puts it very well in this prosy D clip. People keep on criticizing our villains. We need to improve them. What? Any suggestions? How about, I don't know, personality, charm, nuance, some kind of sympathetic quality? Gore is a cut above most villains because the audience can understand his motivations and can sympathize with him to a partial degree, which is hard to do in just one movie. But what would make Gore even better is a more personal connection to Thor. That way Thor, the person who should have an arc in this story, can fight an outer demon, a villain, while also overcoming some kind of inner demon. My third and final major problem with the film is that, as an audience, we often struggle to feel the urgency that the movie is trying to present to us. It often seems like the plot is meandering. Sure, Gore has kidnapped the children, so one of our hero's outer goals should be to get them back, but what's the urgency? Is Gore going to kill those children? I never got that impression from him, so why should I be concerned? We later find out that Gore's ultimate goal is to wish to eternity the death of all gods, but as an audience member I'm left asking, so what? From what the movie presents to us, it seems like the universe would be better off if Gore made that wish. Yes, we know that Thor will die, but the movie needs to show us the ripple effects of that. Why is any of this a big deal? Not to mention how the characters keep going back to New Asgard as if they don't have other things that they should be doing. The movies ignoring the urgency is especially evident when they go to Omnipotent City. While they do have a goal in going there, it seems so random. Gore is powerful, so we should create an army of gods. What? Why hasn't Thor ever thought of this idea on any past adventure? You could even write out that entire sequence from the movie and it would have no impact on the larger narrative. We wouldn't miss anything. No. You see, you get the full hymn's worth. <laughs> okay, we would miss something, but not plot related. The movie has many more problems besides these, I'm sure, but these are the ones that shaped my rewrite the most. So without further ado, here is the rough draft of Thor, Love and Thunder. We open on a small ship in deep space. We're told that this is 2018, just after Thanos attacked Thor's ship. Valkyrie and Korg are running around like crazy, handing out food, water, blankets, and medical treatment. Amidst the panic, we see one man cradling his daughter in his arms. He's not Asgardian, the markings on his body show he's some other species, but he's among the refugees. Valkyrie comes to the man and the girl, offering water. The little girl asks Valkyrie if everything will be okay, and Valkyrie assures her that it will. The girl's father agrees, assuring her that Thor will make everything okay as long as they have faith in him. Screen to black, Marvel logo plays. The movie reopens with Thor on a hillside under a tree. From here, the movie essentially plays out as it does in the original. Thor has a battle alongside the Guardians of the Galaxy. 
Thor asks Quill to play that song that he likes, Sweet Child of Mine. The relationship is slightly different from what we see in the movie. The Guardians are a little tired of Thor and Korg since Thor has a big personality and Korg doesn't know his own size, but there's still camaraderie there. We can do the training montage to show that Thor got ripped again, and we can also showcase some adventures that Thor has had with the Guardians, showing that they've learned from each other. Meanwhile, back on Earth, we see a hooded tourist observing Mjolnir in New Asgard. It's Jane, but the audience doesn't know that yet. We also get a scene of Gore attacking Sif, but his face is never shown. He successfully cuts off her arm and leaves her to die. After all that, we come back from the end of the battle where Thor and Quill are walking back to the ship together. They speak briefly, and Thor asks Quill if he's fulfilled with Gomorrah gone. Quill explains that while it sucks, he's more content to feel crappy than to feel nothing. Thor doesn't really understand where he's coming from. Despite all that Thor has learned about himself, there's still one thing that eats at him. Why did Jane leave him? Suddenly, just as Thor is about to board the ship, he can hear Mjolnir calling out to him. He tells the Guardians this, saying he has to go back to New Asgard to answer the call. The Guardians receive a distress signal, so they part ways, leaving Thor and Korg a bit in the dust. They can receive the goats too if the movie wants, it's not like, integral to the plot or anything. Thor and Korg arrive in New Asgard thanks to the Bifrost, and Valkyrie is like, Thor, thank goodness you're here, I've been trying to reach you. And Thor's like, whoa, what's going on? And Valkyrie's like, haven't you heard? And Thor's like, heard what? Suddenly, screams from the town. Thor and Valkyrie fly or jump over there, and Korg can say something like, whoa, wait up, as he runs after them. From there we get a similar scene to what was shown to us in the movie, the Asgardians are fighting these shadow berserkers. Amidst all the chaos, Mjolnir flies through the waves of monsters and Thor is of course confused. He sees a masked female Thor catch Mjolnir, but before he can dwell on it, he sees a figure in the distance. Thor jumps to the figure, assuming he's responsible for all the trouble, demanding to know who he is. Gore taunts him for not remembering, and the two begin to fight, Thor observing the Necro Sword. Thor gets the upper hand, knocking Gore to the ground, and having learned his lesson with Thanos, attempts to kill Gore immediately, but Gore manages to roll to one side and Thor cuts off his arm. Thor is ready to strike again, but Gore grows a shadow arm, holding his sword horizontally to block Stormbreaker. Gore says something like, Your will is strong, your eyes have not yet been opened, and he vanishes into shadow. Thor goes back to town where he confronts the female Thor, saying, Listen buddy, I don't know who you think you are wielding that hammer, and she reveals herself to be Jane. Shocked, he asks, Jane? What are you doing here? And Jane explains that she heard Mjolnir calling to her. He says the same. He stumbles over his words awkwardly, but they don't have much of a moment together as Valkyrie takes charge and demands that everyone take inventory of the town's resources. Thor asks Valkyrie what's going on and... Transition to the infirmary. Thor, Jane, and Valkyrie stand over a one-armed Sif who's still recovering. Sif and Valkyrie explain what they know. His name is Gore the God Butcher. About five years ago, he found the Necro Sword, and since then, he's been slaying lesser gods under the radar. And his guardian lets Valkyrie know that inventory has been taken. Everyone meets in the town hall, and Korg holds Gore's severed arm and asks if anyone dropped it. Valkyrie is told that all the children have been taken. The only missing object is the Book of Yggdrasil. Thor explains to Jane that it's a book detailing the history of the Nine Realms, but beyond that, it's a map that can take Gore nearly anywhere he wants to go. Thor suspects he'll go to Omnipotent City where he can kill just about all the gods he can imagine. So, the four head off to Omnipotent City, just hoping they can get there before Gore does, and praying that he'll spare the children. While on the way, despite the stakes, Thor can't help but ask Jane why she broke things off with him. Jane says while she's really happy to see him, she doesn't think it's a good idea to talk about it, but Thor insists, saying he's gone through a lot since then and he can take it. Jane simply says that it could never work between a god and a mortal, but doesn't really elaborate. Thor and Korg talk it out, and Thor is just in disbelief. Who wouldn't want to be with a god? His pride gets the better of him. Meanwhile, Jane and Valkyrie talk about Jane's newfound powers, and how she feels doing superhero things now. If she's nervous, scared, etc. They reach Omnipotent City and hustle to warn Zeus of the impending threat. They interrupt a huge conference among many gods. Korg sees his god amongst the crowd, waving to him. Zeus is displeased with the intrusion, and we can do the whole chaining up Thor, getting him naked, whatever. Zeus takes no responsibility for any bad thing that might happen, assuring everyone that Gore will never arrive and that Thor is a liar. There's a fight scene between Zeus's men and the four heroes. Eventually, Gore does make it to Omnipotent City and he just starts mowing down gods left and right thanks to the element of surprise. Korg can become rubble again, in fact, he can even die if Marvel doesn't have any specific future plans for him. Just a thought. There's a huge panic, including Zeus who attempts to escape unseen, leaving everyone behind, but Thor spots him. 
Zeus, frightened, says, Don't you understand? He's here for my lightning bolt. And Thor asks, Why would he be here for your lightning bolt? And Zeus responds, Because it's the key to Uatu. The audience doesn't know what that means yet, but Thor does. Before they can even continue the conversation, Gore appears out of the shadows, snatching the lightning bolt from Zeus, stabbing him, and getting away, knowing he can't take on Thor yet. So, Gore retreats, but now Thor knows where he's going. Thor doesn't know what Gore would want with Uatu, explaining to the others that Uatu is merely a watcher, an observer. He holds no real weapon. As the group makes their way to the nexus of all realities, providing some wacky visuals for Taika to work with, Thor and Jane banter. Thor tells her how well she's done in the fights up to this point. They chat, and it seems like they're cozying up to one another. That's when they make it to Uatu's door, already opened, the lightning bolt sticking out of it. They enter cautiously, Korg's head waiting back on the boat if he's not dead. Once they reach Uatu's room, they find his body on the ground. Thor runs over to him, turning his body over to find Uatu is missing an eye, seemingly dead. Thor and the gang are snatched up by ropes of shadow, their mouths covered, much like they were in the Shadow Realm during the movie. Gore steps out of the shadows holding Uatu's eye attached to his neck by a chain, beholding moving pictures within it. He taunts the group, pointing out Valkyrie's god dug the graves of her sisters. Gore turns to Jane and asks, And what about you? What god do you put your faith in? Did you think that they might save you from your cancer? And Thor's like, Huh? Because he didn't know that Jane had cancer. Since Thor is our main character here, he should find out at the same time the audience does. If you're familiar with Jane's character from the comics, you know that cancer is a pretty integral part of that character, but the MCU has been known to mix things up and could still surprise many, I'm sure, if they just held back on that reveal. Jane gives Thor an apologetic look. Gore steps between their stare and says to Thor, But you, your spirit remains unbroken. You don't see as they do, for you are a god yourself. Let me show you the truth. And he puts a hand on Thor's forehead while Uatu's eye lights up. We see what Thor sees, a very quick montage of pestilence, death, war, famine, destruction, everything that the gods ought to prevent. The montage reaches a cut to black before opening on Gore, who holds his daughter tightly while others turn to ashes around them. Gore pleads with his daughter to stay with him, but she too turns to dust soon enough. Gore looks up at the sky and curses Thor for failing him. Fast forward, Gore finds the necro sword. Fast forward again, and the snap is reversed. Gore finds his daughter, but she's frightened of him, running, screaming, shunning him. And the god butcher blames Thor for this once again. Once that's done, there's another quick play-by-play -play of suffering for Thor to see, before he's rudely awakened into consciousness again. Thor is released from the shadows and falls to his knees, dropping Stormbreaker. His breathing is heavy, and he doesn't look up. So, you see the truth, Gore asserts, and he lifts his sword above his head, prepared to slash it down on Thor. The universe would be better off without gods. Just as Gore is about to land a finishing blow, Valkyrie releases herself from the shadows and begins to fight him. Jane reminds Valkyrie that they need him alive for the kid's sake. She releases herself from the shadows and quickly kneels next to Thor, asking what happened. Thor explains, he showed me everything. Everything the gods have done to their people. Everything they could have stopped. Everything I could have stopped. Jane recognizes he's referring to Thanos. She sympathizes with him, but doesn't know what to say. She quickly gets up to join the fight against Gore, and it seems Thor simply cannot move. Valkyrie and Jane fight the God Butcher, and soon enough he knocks Valkyrie against the wall with a bloody nose. But not before she manages to snatch the eye from off his neck. Unfortunately, he then stabs Jane in the heart and she topples to the ground. Thor screams. Uatu's body begins stirring, and Gore says, you'll know where to find me, before retreating once again. Thor struggles to crawl over to Jane, taking her in his arms. Jane drops Mjolnir, and she becomes her frail human self. Thor can't find the words. All he can say is, Jane, over and over again. He finally manages to say, you were right. I'm just a terrible, selfish god. It never would have worked between us. I couldn't save you from Gore from your cancer. Jane softly shushes him and says, I always knew it was going to end up like this. Thor asks what she means. You're not terrible. You're not selfish. I didn't stop loving you because you're a god. I always knew you'd outlive me by a large margin, especially when I was diagnosed. Mjolnir was always just a temporary fix, and I didn't want to give everything to you knowing that you'd forget me one day. Thor responds, Jane, no, not you. I could never, ever forget you. Jane smiles as tears stream down her face. Thor, I need you to remember. You might be the god of thunder, but you are so, so much more. Gore might be right. Maybe the world would be better off without gods. But the way you take responsibility for your mistakes shows me what I wish I had realized all those years ago. 
You're more than just a god. The world would not be better off without you. And Jane dies in his arms. Thor sets her down gently as he sobs, his face resting over her for a moment, kissing her on the cheek. He stands with a struggle and goes to Valkyrie, who's still breathing, but she's sustained great damage. She holds up the eye to Thor, and a voice from off-screen says, I'll take that. It's Uatu, not yet dead, just weak. He walks over to the pair, takes the eye, and replaces it in his skull. He tells Thor that Gore's limited mind prevented him from seeing the future, and that he awaits Thor in the Shadow Realm for a final winner-take-all confrontation. Thor asks how to beat him, but much like Doctor Strange, Uatu says that he can't divulge that. Valkyrie assures Thor that she'll be alright. Thor summons Mjolnir and Stormbreaker to his hands and flies off to the Shadow Realm. All is quiet on the small planet, and he sees Gore in the distance. Thor shouts, Release the children! Gore responds, Why should I? You couldn't save my child, why should I let you save theirs? Why not let all of Asgard see the fraud that you are? Thor responds, Gore, you have yourself to blame just as much as me for your daughter. Take responsibility for your mistakes and she can still be yours. Gore responds, Liar! and comes to swing at Thor, who blocks with Mjolnir. They have a fight scene. Thor becomes disarmed, and Gore is about to kill him. But Thor grabs the sword with a clap, just before it comes down on him. And with all his strength, he keeps the blade from going down any further, and tears it from Gore's hands, causing the God Butcher to fall to the ground. Thor raises the sword, prepared to kill, but he looks on Gore for a moment, pausing. Then, he snaps the sword in half like a twig over his knee. In a flash of light, color is restored to the sphere around them, and Gore is no longer influenced by the Necro Sword. Thor tosses the two halves of the sword aside. Gore looks up at the God of Thunder and says, Odinson, I'm so sorry. The sword, it, it poisoned me. He pauses. I poison myself. I am dying. Thor gets on one knee as the shadow fades from the world. Thor sees the children uncovered from the shadows, in a cage. On observing the children, he looks down at Gore and says, Tell me where your daughter is. I know with the Watcher's eye you must have seen where she is. Tell me, and you have my word. I will find her and take care of her. Gore hesitates, and Thor says, Think of her, not of yourself. You don't need to keep her from happiness because of your sins. Gore nods and slowly pulls himself up to whisper in Thor's ear. And with that, Gore dies, and Thor crosses the former God Butcher's arm over his chest, leaving him to rest peacefully and he goes to collect the children, summoning Mjolnir to his hand again, then Stormbreaker in the other hand, and he takes the children home through the Bifrost. The rest of the movie ends pretty much the same, including the two post credit scenes. And that's Thor Love and Thunder Revised. It's not perfect, I know, but arguably better than the film we got just from a story standpoint. If you want a really fantastic Thor story, read Thor God of Thunder from 2012 by Jason Aaron, Asad Ribic, and Dean White the series where Gore was introduced. Then there's Thor from 2014, which was also written by Aaron with art from Russell Dodderman and Matthew Wilson. Also, I just want to say, I feel like the internet's really turned on Taika Waititi since this movie came out, but that's a little unfair. I think he's still an amazing writer, and I hope he doesn't take all this criticism to heart just from one misfire. What do you think of my revision? Any good? Any bad? Do you prefer the movie we got? Tell me everything. Also, let me know if there are other movies you'd want to see me try and rewrite. And keep in mind, ultimately, this is just a rough draft.